ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Schmodown Rundown. Introducing first, Frankie Stats Janish. And their co-host, the man of controversy, Mr. Brian the Duke David. And finally, your host, Aaron Turner. Let's get ready to Schmodown. What's going on, Movie Trivia Schmodown fans? You are listening to the Schmodown Rundown, the official after show for the Movie Trivia Schmodown. My name is Aaron. I am your host, Frank Janish. He does stats. He's a good guy. He's also here. What's up, man? What's up, fellas? Are we excited for the tournament, man? Yeah. Let's do this. Brackets a plenty. Broken also, brackets a plenty, you mean. <laughs> uh, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> also here, uh, he's going to talk about brackets with us. He is Brian Davids. What's up, man? Hey, guys. Hey. What's going on? Play brackets? <laughs> okay, moving on. All right. Well, as we were talking at the top of the show, brackets are happening. The singles tournament is getting ready to get underway. We're going to have Bracketology 2.0 in the second half of the show. But before we get there, we have to talk about the prizes for said brackets that you can win. You yourself could be in a schmodown. If you live in the continental United States, that is, you submit a perfect bracket to schmodown2017 at gmail.com and you will have the opportunity to be flown to Collider Studios to compete in a Schmodown. That's pretty insane. For the international people, they also get a prize. If you're, or they don't also, it's either or, but if you're an international fan and you submit a perfect bracket, you get to choose a match of your choice between two competitors. I don't know what the restrictions are on that. Could it be anybody from the past? That would be tremendous. But it should be fun either way. Now, Frank, if you had the choice, let's let's play a hypo uh, let's play a hypothetical here. You live in a foreign country, let's I don't know Canada, and <laughs> you get the opportunity. You win the bracket challenge. You get the opportunity to put two players against each other. Who are you putting against each other? You know, since we do have a solid possibility of Harlef Ellis happening at the conclusion of this tournament, I mean that's a real possibility. So if it didn't happen through the tournament, I would personally like to see that one because actually their stats line up just almost identical it's pretty pretty scary i posted their stats before in the group and if you've seen it they're like just off by like one question is the difference between both of them so that's the one i would like to see however i would uh, i'd probably like to see uh jte cody miller rematch mm, wow okay i you know you threw me on that one because I did not expect to hear that, but that makes a right. lot of sense. That, that right. sounds like a lot of fun. Right. What about you, Brian? You you live in a foreign country, uh, not for real, but uh, what would you, who would you put together in a match? I did not catch the part about what the prize is for the international market. Can you repeat what that is again? I'm not following you. You get to put together a schmodown match of your choosing, I, within reason, I assume. So two competitors of your choice, and they will be on a special card. Really? Yes. It's a good idea. Well, I suppose the match that I'm still dying to see would be Bibiani versus McQueenie. There's just something about those two, given that they premiered at the same time. There's something about them I, I still want to see. I, I haven't thought about this, to be honest, but I will see a match that I'm excited to see based on my bracket pick, so more on that later. But in case you're wondering, yes, I am ineligible to win this bracket prize. So, you know, it's understandable. A match that I would like to see... Besides Iron Jim Vavita and Mark Flanker. Bernardin, I think that would be fantastic. Vavita's Vendetta? No, Iron Jim Vavita. That's his name. <laughs> Flying V? Yeah, got it. No. I would actually like to see a beard versus beard match. I'm throwing special stipulations in there between Josh Makuga and Nick Scarpino. I think it could possibly be the funnest Schmodown of all time. It could be the one where the most people are seduced. I think it could be a lot of fun. I would put that match together. Well, it's time for Azora High's favorite segment, The Ward Wing. This is art. 
Mr. White? Well, as you can see from our YouTube art, the official Ultimate Schmodown Singles Tournament artwork is already released and reveling in all its glory. Besides the official poster, Brian did a quick poster for the Fatal 5-Way Wildcard. He also designed a couple Hall of Fame plaques slash carbonite molds for the greatest of all time, Dan Merle, as well as the presently retired slash two-time champ, Mark Yodi Riley. For more Brian Ward, follow him on Twitter at Brian E. Ward and visit his website. Check out his portfolio at brianeward.com. All right, guys, we're going to jump into our first recap today. Well, it's the only recap this week. It was a fatal five-way match. The winner gets a chance in the singles tournament against John Roca in the first round. It was Jason Inman versus Scott Mance versus Elliot Dewberry versus Robert Meyer Burnett versus a question mark that we later found out to be Team Action's Ben Bateman. Frank, were you surprised by this turnout? Were you, were you expecting Ben, or were you expecting somebody else? I wasn't really. I didn't know who to expect, and so that was that was fun to watch Ben Watt walk out. Um, and I'm glad that it was him because, as we've seen, Team Action that was on quite a has been on quite a run, and so has Ben for that matter in the first and third rounds, and just throughout the entire match, he's been on fire. So I was really excited to see Ben come out and be that mystery fifth player. What about you, Brian? To be honest, I still don't care for these mystery player scenarios, but compared to the 10-month Makuga mystery partner saga, at least this one was wrapped up fairly quickly as one of the team tournament's brightest stars just so happened to win the lottery. So I'm a big fan of Ben. He's been on the show. He's been great. We hope to have him on again soon. But Aaron, what do you think of Ben Bateman beginning his singles career in this fashion? I like it. Team Action is hot right now. They have the hottest, most uh, growing by numbers group in the movie trivia showdown world with the Action Army. Yeah. Seems like there's 50,000 members of that group and more and more every day. That was an exaggeration, but they have a lot and they have a very rabid fan base. And uh, of course, I would love to see Ben in there and this is only going to satiate them right now. But let me ask you guys, they've been doing a lot of three-man tables of late. It seems like they're training some options for when Harloff is on paternity leave. So, Frank, let me get your thoughts on the three-man tables. Do you think they work? Do you like them, or, or do you still just prefer two? Um, I kind of – actually, I like this version of the three-man table. Usually I'm not too big of a fan of it because I think it's a little crowded, but I like the fact that Riley was mainly there just to ask the questions, and he had Alice's – Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the uh, title That's match, fine. actually. The general questions, still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll go back to, yeah, I'm talking about that one. And I like that dynamic because Alice was there to uh, fill in fill in the void between questions being answered. And Riley was there to basically ask, ask the questions. I like the way that flowed. So, uh, yeah, normally I'm not too big of a fan on the, th- on the three person table, but uh, that version I did like. I like the idea of them giving people more reps, especially for when Christian is on leave. However, I don't like the three-man tables in general, especially in a fatal five-way or team match, because there are about seven to eight voices talking, sometimes all at once. So I didn't mind it in the Harloff-Merle match like you, Frank, because Riley had a purpose, Ellis had a purpose, etc. But in this case, where there's already four to five players at the table playing, I think it gets a bit too busy at times. And there was a little too much chaos, especially in round three. Uh, Turner, what are your thoughts on the three-man tables? I prefer the traditional two-man uh, or two-person booth. But the third dynamic I, is something I'm open to, the third person. Just to get another personality on there, I'm fine with it. If you have somebody like Matt Iceman that comes in, Totally fine with it. And then for this particular case, you have uh, Roca sitting in, you know, looking for his next challenger. So that's kind of a different thing. The WWE does that all the time. So it's not something out of the ordinary, but I do prefer the traditional. Commenters, I'm curious, what do you think of the tri table setup? Is three a crowd when it comes to the Schmodown? Comment below and let us know for you YouTube listeners. And I just want to say hashtag Jen at the table. 
So guys, when we started this match, it was only Fredo Knapsack sitting at the table. They set this up in order to introduce JSR and then Harloff as champion. So Frank, what did you think of this bizarre introduction of the three-man table? And did you notice how the glare on Kay's belt was messing up the camera initially? I mean, they fixed it, but did you see how shiny that glare was? I did not notice the glare actually. Um, but then when I saw, but when I saw Ken out there just by himself, I thought that was pretty curious. I didn't know if they had another special guest commentator coming to the table. Uh, but then I realized why they did what they did when they introduced Roka and Harloff in the manner in which they did, and for the reasons. So I thought that was, um, I thought that was that was pretty nice and fine. Yeah. Turner, any thoughts on this uh, unusual introduction with Ken starting out by himself? Well, it's Christian's first time being on camera since he won the championship, so it makes sense that he would get some sort of grandiose entrance, albeit not too grand, but you know enough to acknowledge that he won the title and still feels weird to see him as champion. Uh, and like I said just a minute ago, Roca coming out as just a scout competition is, is nothing new. They do that all the time. And, and Fair enough. Well, should we get to round one? Let's talk about it, guys. We had Ben Bateman join in the fray. A lot of questions going around. Jason Inman and Ben were at the top of the leaderboard after one, both with six points, and the other three competitors, Elliot, Robert Meyer Burnett, and Scott Mance, all with three. So, Frank, at the end of round one, we see two guys at the moment that are well ahead. What did you think? Super surprised by Scott Mance's performances, uh, missing the first four in a row, just like Robert Meyer Burnett. I wasn't too surprised at Robert Meyer Burnett's uh, start right out of the gate. Uh, Inman... A little stronger than I thought he would be. I mean, I think he is a decent player, but to uh, answer and perform the way he did in the first round, keep pace with Ben Bateman, um, that was really fun to see, especially given their brief history in the team tournament. Yeah, absolutely. Brian, what would you think? As far as the round, Inman and Bateman were the standouts with six points each. It's no surprise that they battled it out until the end. Inman and Mance continue to remind me of why I call them Treckle and Hyde. They're great one match, awful the next, and with each match, one of them steps up while the others disappear. I realize this wasn't a team match, but their performance is still all over the place. But sadly, Robert Meyer Burnett is still the Schmodown's equivalent of the big sick. Yeah. Elliot, much to my disappointment, didn't make much of an impression. So the Wildberries are off to a rather inauspicious debut. But Turner, any other thoughts on the performance in round one? I forgot to mention uh, Elliot's promo where he said he was told it was a fatal five play, so he thought it was going to be sexual. <laughs> um, that's pretty fun. That was uh, good, yeah. No matter any way you slice it, that's pretty fun. So I was rooting for him uh, from jump. But, it, yeah, it did surprise me that Ben was at the top. I, like you, Frank, was a little surprised with Mance's low total. And I'm just waiting for Burnett to just to just pop again. Like the inner geekdom fatal five way Burnett, I need him to come back. And I know this was his singles debut, more or less, but man, I need Robert Meyer Burnett to be good because he's so good on the mic. He's such a great personality. I need him to be in these matches. I, I need that. So that's a little disappointing, but it's it's interesting. There was a universal miss on question one, and we don't see those too often, especially yeah. in five ways. So, Frank, is this something that you tally universal misses? Actually, it's not, and when this happened, I was like, I should probably go back and kind kind of keep track of this. It doesn't happen yeah. a lot, you're right, but uh, it would be interesting to have that number and what categories it happens in. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's always crazy, even when it happens in team play. And question three, Christian again referred to the younger players at the table as young bucks, again, rubbing more salt in RB3's <laughs> wounds. I still want to see more RB3 in the Schmodown, but... Guys, let's not bury the lead any longer. At the end of round one, heading into round two, Christian quickly remarked that there would be no eliminations until the players were mathematically eliminated. So I leaped out of my chair upon hearing this, and I did the 500 Days of Summer Dance because I was elated. Strangely enough, they didn't really talk about the Fatal Five-Way reformatting before the match. So Anyone who's listened to this show for a while knows that most of us weren't too fond of the previous Fatal Five-Way format since we all 
would get excited about new players like Feldman or Ishii, only they'd be eliminated after three to five minutes. Furthermore, the previous format didn't always reward the best player in the five way, just whomever had the best round at the right time, all of Johns and Cushing in that decisive speed round and inner geekdom. So this revised format is a godsend as I now have a newfound fondness for fatal five ways, especially since they allow us to get a look at many players without having to wait two to three months for the schedule to open up via singles, teams, or IGD. So Turner, thoughts on the reformatted Fatal Five way? I'm glad that they went and thought about it a little bit and said, you know what, this needs to change. We have an initiative to get more people in here. This is the way to do it. We can keep eyes on it longer. We can have more of people's favorite players in there for longer. So it works out all across the board in my eyes. I think it's a great move. Yeah, I love this this change that they made, and I'm glad they made it. And, you know, going back to when they first started these Fatal Five Ways, you, you, there's no blueprint for this movie trivia showdown out there. You know, they're the first out there to do something like this. So you're not going to hit a home run every time you try something new. But as, I think what you, we can take out of this is that when they try something new, they always learn from that first time and adjust it uh, for the second time or the third time until they get it to a way – that they, th- that they think and feel that it works the best. And I think when you have all five of these players go through the entire match, it made for great entertainment and drama, and uh, it was really fun to watch. It's just a great way to evaluate talent because when it comes to someone like Charlie Feldman or Eric Ishii, they didn't play long enough. Uh, Michelle Boyd as well. They didn't play long enough for us to truly get a good read on their skills, on their on their knowledge. So by being able to compete for longer we get a better read on what they're able to do in future matches. So I think this is the the best case scenario all around. Yeah, I mean, go look, go and look back at the Star Wars Schmodown, which was a fatal five way of sorts, but nobody got eliminated until yeah. later. Imagine, imagine if you will, if Sam Witwer had a bad round and he was eliminated first. Oh my right. goodness. That would have yeah. been awful. So this format really takes that problem right out of it. Absolutely great call there. Let's talk about round two now. We had Ben going first. He got two thousands. He goes two of three for four points. Jason Inman up next. Denzel Washington. He goes three of three for four points. Plus, he did add a one point steal later in the round. Scott Mance came up and spun uh, that bitch, Cameron Diaz. <laughs> he went three of three. Got them all, though. Four points. Elliot Dewberry came up, got action adventure. He went two of three. For four points, Robert Meyer Burnett comes up. He also gets two thousands because in this in this format you can get the same category and you can be you can use it twice. Burnett goes three of three for five points. The first thing that sticks out to me in this round is you had so many chances for a steal, more or less, and and nobody stole anything. Was that surprising to you guys? Except for Inman, he got one steal. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That was actually pretty surprising. Um, yeah, there was only two opportunities throughout this match for steals. Inman was gra- was able to grab one point, with four other people having a chance at it. It's surprising that more wasn't stolen. Yeah. What about you, Brian? What stuck out to you? Well, it's important to point out that Inman deferred to Bateman, so Bateman was frustrated that Inman was now using. Bateman's defer strategy, something that Trek doesn't normally do. So everybody's on this defer kick since it's been working so well for above the line. Obviously, it didn't work for critically acclaimed, but that's a whole different story. But yeah, we're we're still seeing some difficult questions. I mean, there's been a big uptick as far as difficulty lately, and that seems to be the case as far as the performance so far in this match. And not much changed after this round as Inman and Bateman. Bateman and Inman, Inman is Bateman. They still led by three to four points as Mance and Dewberry scored four points each as did Bateman. Dagnino must have used some shock paddles on R&B in between rounds because he woke up briefly scoring five out of six points. That matched Inman's five points on the round. So Inman's won two rounds at this point when you consider that uh, he had the most points or tied for the most points in round one, tied for the most points in round two. So I guess you'd give him the advantage given that he's got 11 points overall. He's got the lead going into round three. So 
just when everybody was ready to write off Jason Inman, he comes back proving once again how schizophrenic Team Trek is both individually and collectively. Frank, I didn't get your overall take. What do you think of round two overall? Yeah, I want to echo, echo what Brian just said about Inman deferring. I thought it was hilarious that he used Team Action's preferred method in the second round against Ben Bateman, forcing him to be the very first one. He wasn't like the second or third. He was the very first one and had to wait while everyone else went. Sure, I gave him steal opportunities, uh, which he was unable to capitalize. Oh, he only got one steal opportunity. Uh, I thought it was hilarious that Inman deferred to him. And then when Inman had the opportunity to defer again, instead he went second. And, yeah, he had a solid second round, uh, scoring four points in his turn. So uh, I thought it was a pretty good second round all the way through. Uh, Again, only two questions missed overall through everyone. So it it was a pretty fun round to watch. Guys, what was up when it came to question two for Dewberry? There was a multiple choice question and went to multiple choice key for Sutherland was the answer, but how did Mance not guess with multiple choice? Yeah. I, I mean, thought that was very strange. His focus again is it's always hit or miss. You never know when he's paying attention or not when he's focused or not. And this is why I keep saying Scott and Jason are treckle and hide. You do not know which version you're going to get when you've got multiple choice. You've got to guess that that is inexcusable to not guess on multiple choice. It's just, that cannot happen. Even if you don't remember the options, write a letter. I don't, you know, I mean, for real, just well, you, write can, a you can repeat that. You can have them, repeat them without being charged. Without right. being charged. Okay. Even if you forget that though, I mean, hell again, just write a letter. <laughs> so he, I, I guarantee he zoned out and just wasn't paying attention. So, uh, the end of round two, Inman led with 11, Ben had 10, Robert Meyer Burnett with eight, and Mance and Dewberry were both tied at seven, which brought us to round three, which, give me a second, because it's 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 chaotic, but I'm going to go through it here. We had Elliot up first. He missed the two-point question, which was Anne Hathaway in becoming Jane. Then he, he got the three-point question, which was Dick Tracy, We moved over to Scott Mance, who got the two-pointer. Doc Ock lost his wife in Spider-Man 2. We move over to Robert Meyer Burnett, who missed the two-point question. The state was Alaska in the Simpsons movie. Burnett also missed the three-pointer. The dice read five or eight in Jumanji. And now Burnett had to get the five-pointer to stay in the game. He got it. Kevin Spacey was the voice in Moon. So Burnett's point total caps out at 13 since he got all of questions asked to him. We move back to Scott Mance. He got his three-pointer, Ben Affleck, and Jennifer Lopez with the Razzie nominations. So now we move over to Elliot, who could not pull the Tom Hanks question. And our first elimination is Elliot Dewberry. We move over to Ben Bateman. He missed the two-pointer, which was Beethoven. Then he got his three-pointer, which was Tombstone, did release before Wyatt Earp. Now we move over to Jason Inman. He missed his two-point question. The beach was directed by Danny Boyle. He missed the three-point question. Throw Mama from the Train was inspired by Strangers on the Train. But Inman did get the five-pointer, and this was all important. The Lord of the Rings composer, and Inman caps his total at 16, which currently put him back up top the leaderboard, which also eliminated Robert Meyer Burnett in the process. Now we're over to Scott Mance. He missed the five-pointer, which was the Braveheart movie quote. That was the crusher for Mance, and he is eliminated. So now we are down to two. Ben Bateman and Jason Edman, who played the male lead in my big fat Greek wedding for the win for Ben Bateman. He could not pull it. It was John Corbett, and Jason Edman wins the Fatal Five-Way with 16 points. He will face John Rocha in round one. I'm out of breath. Frank, what would you think? (laughs) Yeah, Turner, go take five. Uh, <laughs> that, was a, that was a lot. <laughs> uh, this was a really fun way to watch the third round, just going bouncing back and forth between certain players. Uh, it was very interesting to watch. We have never seen anything quite like it. Sure, the Star Wars match, but the chance to get into the tournament, it was really down to Inman and Bateman. I, you know, uh, no real uh, threats outside of those two to get out of this match successfully. Um, I thought Inman, the wheel started to come off there, missing the two and the three. And then, lo and behold, he pretty much gets an inner geekdom question. 
Uh, so he's been studying up, and it showed with answering his five pointer. And I thought, you know, and still Ben had a shot to win this. It was in his grasp. Unfortunately, um, couldn't pull through. So again, it was just a really fun way to watch this all go down. And uh, I'm glad everyone basically got a chance to answer all three questions. Brian, your take on round three and Jason Inman pulling off the victory. Well, as round one and two proved, it was coming down to Inman and Bateman, Bateman and Inman. Ben had the chance for the walk-off. However, John Corbett, a.k.a. that guy, just wasn't on his mind. And I'm guessing he had tired eyes behind his dark glasses because it just seemed like he he wasn't sharp in this particular moment. Really, this particular match, he seemed a bit a bit uh, draggy, if that's a word. But I've said this before. We said this in regard to the Wolves of Steel LWTP knockout. I would like to see on the screen when players are on the brink. So I, I had trouble tracking who was about to be eliminated or not. So I think it'd be helpful to know if Mance doesn't answer this, he's eliminated. So just seeing something flashing on the screen would really uh, help me out, at least as far as tracking all this. It would even add drama, more drama, to certain points as well. So all in all, it was an exciting round three. I'm still shocked that Jason Inman, after a rather unimpressive tournament appearance in two matches, just comes out and is unfazed and wins this. So this is why we love the Schmodown, because anything is truly possible. I thought round three, obviously by my reading, was a little chaotic. But I think that added to it. It made me pay more attention. It's like, okay, well, this this person may be out next, so I need to pay really close attention here. And I do see what you're saying with the maybe put a graphic up in the corner about, hey, Mance is on the brink. But at the same time, I kind of liked it the way it was, like the chaotic format. Jason Inman is a guy that I think if you would have asked me rank the top five of this, who do you think would win, I would probably have Inman at three or four. I, I didn't think he would pull it off. Not because he's not a good player. I just thought that, Maybe in my head, I was like, well, you know, Team Action has this thing with top 10, so maybe Ben will play especially hard to try to get to Roka, and then Mance, Roka 3, like all that kind of stuff. I guess like maybe I, my dreams were getting ahead of myself, but it, it was a fun match overall to watch, and congratulations to Jason Edmund. Let me ask you guys, when it comes to Razzie questions like we saw in the case of Benifer, do you think these questions should be part of the Schmodown mix of questions do you think they are relevant to the shimona should we be celebrating the razzies via questions yeah that's uh i thought about the same thing when that question popped up um still impressive man's got it yeah um but yeah i was thinking the same thing i was like i don't i'm not sure if those kind of questions belong in the schmo down because i mean it's not an oscar category you know it's complete opposite of that yeah the fact that i'm thinking about it I guess I'm leaning towards Razzy questions don't really deserve to be in the Schmodown, in my opinion. Well, I'm glad that you noticed it too. And I think the only other relevant example of a Razzy question that would work is the fact that Sandra Bullock, the year that she won for the blind side, she also won the Razzy for All About Steve. So as long as they're tying the Razzy to a category we do care about Oscars, that would be uh, relevant, I think. But as far as Razzies being an actual category that's sometimes drawn from, I'm kind of nervous about that. Uh, Turner, any issue with Razzie questions? <clears throat> I think more people would obviously keep track of Oscars as opposed to Razzies. Mm-hmm. Like, like the Razzies are just kind of a fun thing. It's like winning an MTV movie award. Like that's cool, but I guess, but I'm not going to keep track of it. So a little bit more difficult had it not been oddly enough, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez for the answer. I might have had a bit of an issue with it, but I think a great idea that you just had, Brian, was tying it in to something like Sandra Bullock's case. That that might be a good way to do it, but on their own, uh, no thanks. I mean, we're supposed to be celebrating film, filmmaking, and Razzies are just cheap publicity stunts to kind of take shots at film. So I don't know. It's just an interesting discussion. How many uh, Razzies did The Dark Knight Rises win? (laughs) Not as many. Is Batman versus Superman. That's um, fair. That's, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very fair. Guys, a few more things before we get to bracketology. During Inman's post interview, he said the following quote I know that he's an evil, evil man, but now he's a hero again. 
that's what Jason Inman said in regard to his round one opponent. So Trek, like I've been saying, together individually, they're just so schizophrenic and inconsistent. Even their post-interview comments are all over the place. So they are truly the Trek one hide, as I keep saying. And I'm truly overall relieved that we did not have to, to save the round one reveal for the actual tourney, unlike the team tournament. So asking people to fill out brackets while knowing all the players, I think, is the, the wise move moving forward. I'm sure they won't repeat uh, what they did in the team tournaments, but I like that we're now picking our brackets with all the players in mind. And lastly, for the fantasy segment, we got maybe our second or third image of a monkey with a ball. So guys, do you think this is setting up anything in regard to the fantasy segment? Is something coming? Yeah, King Kong. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of these. Frank, do you think uh, we're getting some kind of souped up fantasy segment given these weird images that keep coming up? A souped up fantasy segment. Wow. Um, no. <laughs> Other than that, I really don't know. Maybe Makuga was all filming his new show. Well, um, Harloff did tease that Makuga was going to be making some additions or improvements to the fa fantasy segments. I know some fans have voiced their want for like boxing style stat cards, perhaps. So uh, Frankie numbers, you'd be perfect for that role, of course. So I don't know. It's, it's happened a few times now. It could be just Makuga is busy with wedding stuff, filming 12 other shows. But uh, Christian did say that Josh was working on adding something to these fantasy segment so just something to bookmark and perhaps we'll come back to it at a future point all right guys we're going to be back with bracketology 2 right after this hello everyone your faithful host aaron here do you like what you're hearing so far on the rundown great give us a thumbs up if you're listening on youtube leave a comment join the discussion listening via itunes please rate and review the schmoes no itunes feed it helps us out tremendously. It helps us move up and down on the charts. That way more people can listen and more people can get involved. We would really appreciate it. Be sure to check out the other shows on SK Plus on YouTube. There is something different for you every single day. Different shows with different personalities. You can't go wrong. Be sure to follow the show on Twitter at SD Rundown and email us anytime. Schmodown rundown at gmail.com and now back to your back back to me all right guys we're back from break and now it is time for schmodown rundown bracketology all right guys we're gonna break down this year's singles tournament we're going to go through all the matches and get our picks for who we think is going to be this year's champion last year it was baby carrots mark ellis it could possibly be again and with christian as the champion that leaves a lot of great possibilities let's start in the top left corner it will be john roca versus jason edmund we just talked about him. so frank who you got here i'm gonna take roca because he's coming here with 72% accuracy rate lifetime. Jason Inman is hovering above 50% lifetime, uh, if you're not counting how he performed in the teams. So, yeah, I just think Roka is, is – yeah, he's going to win. If it was somebody else other than than Inman, uh, like a Bateman or even Scott Mance, I'd give them more of a shot. I know that's, like, kind of stupid to say because Inman did win the Fatal Five-Way, but – Anybody can have a great match and a down match, as we've seen throughout this entire history of the Schmodown. And uh, while I do think Roka's going to win, it's not going to be the greatest performance, but it's going to be enough to get him past Inman. I saw a lot of people in the Facebook group actually picking Inman to go pretty far. And I don't know if that's you know due to fandom. Do they think he's actually going to pull it off and win? I'm not sure. I mean, I have Roka here. I think there's just no way that Roka's going to lose in the first round. I just, I just don't see it happening. Brian, what about you? As I've been saying, Team Trek together and individually, the Trek on high. And I keep saying this because I'm just so impressed with this pun. But they tend to look great. They tend to look great when they have virtually no expectations placed on them. To that point, there are certain players and teams that impress when there's nothing expected out of them. 
But as soon as you bet on them and place expectations on them, they seldom perform. So Inman just isn't a guy I bet on, even though he's fully capable of beating JSR. So JSR will advance since Jason Inman just won a match. And for some reason, he just cannot stream together back-to-back solid performances. The next matchup is the Beast, William Viviani versus Sam Levine and what promises to be a great one. I think it's going to be maybe the best one of the first round. We'll have to wait and see. Frank, what do you think? How do you see it going? Yeah, this could be a real, real barn burner. Uh, Viviani's entering with a 3-2 and two record, answering 81%, which is just filthy, but he's still 3-2 and two somehow. So I know his strategy is to answer all the questions, but uh, he might need to actually develop an actual strategy to beat Sam Levine because Sam Levine has a strategy, and I think that's what's going to carry him through here to uh, defeat the Beast. Wow, hot take. Brian, what do you think? Thanks to MVP and above the line, Sam Levine has found his groove within the Schmodown. I think our conversation with Sam last week proves that as well. But when you look under the hood of his singles losses, He's played the best players in this league as closely as anyone. That includes Dan Merle, Mark Riley, Mark Ellis, and Clark Wolf, all of whom have won the belt or played for it. So let's not forget his win over Snyder either. I mean, Snyder is a, a heck of a player on his, in his own right. But friend of the show, William Bibiani, as far as pure knowledge, knows as much as anyone in this league. But that's worked against him so far especially in matches with stakes since pie in the sky expectations are then placed on him. Plus this bracket was designed with rivalries and civil wars in mind. Thus the JSR beast match that has been kayfabe to death just isn't going to happen since so many people want to see it. So look for Levine to light up the scoreboard and advance to round two to play JSR in one of the most underrated and overlooked Schmodown rivalries. Go back and watch Sam's free for all post interview, as well as his comments on our show and throughout the team tourney, and you'll see that he is gunning for JSR. And real quick, I just want to say to that point, Brian, I cannot wait to see the package of Levine taking shots at Roca oh and gosh. vice versa. And then people are going to lose their mind realizing. How did I not see this sooner before? Because you're going to see all this stuff where Levine's taking these little subtle shots. And when you compile them all together, you're going to be like, holy crap, this is amazing. Yeah, Sam is so good at smack talk because he can drop F-bombs and yet he endears himself at the same time. He's got that gift to say whatever he wants and you still like the guy uh, through it all. Uh, I'll hang out on my island. I I like Bibs. I like (laughs) Bibs to win. I love Bibs too, but unfortunately Levine is going to win. Uh, yeah, I got I got the beast, guys. That, that's all. I'll just leave it short and sweet. I got the beast. Let's move down to our next matchup. It'll be Mark Ellis, last year's champion, versus Stacy Howard, one half of Team Six Degrees. Frank, how do you see this one going? I'm going to pick Mark Ellis. This guy's answered close to 70% his entire career in the Schmodown. Stacy Howard, uh, she can be up and she can be down. Uh, and I just think Mark Ellis is going to be too much of a force, a consistent force. Uh, and Stacy Howard will have too much of a trouble keeping up by you Brian who you got we haven't seen much of Mark Ellis since his 2016 single streak ended in a loss to the greatest player of all time Dan Merle my career advisor briefly returned from hiatus Mark Ellis and lost to Clark Wolf so three to four months later I think that the rust will still be present in this match especially since he's not calling as many matches these days. More importantly, much like Handsome Harloff, I'm not sure how much longer Ellis intends to play, given his hectic schedule as a comedian and collidarian. I just don't think his will to win is there any longer. Like most comedians, Mark is self-aware enough to know that The last year, last year's epic run, was likely his best chance of winning the single strap. Meanwhile, Stacey Howard, much like Chandler, 
is as hungry as anyone for a win. So I expect the woman who once dressed like Jessica Rabbit to eat baby carrots alive. I'm taking Mark Ellis to win. I The guy is a champion, team champion, movie trivia showdown singles tournament champion. I just don't see a way that Ellis doesn't win this match. So I'll stick with him. So we move down to the last match on the left side of the bracket. It is the Crusher, Rachel Cushing, versus the Android, Mark and Draco. Frank, who you got? How you see it going? Well, it, this is one of my most anticipated matches of the first round. I think it's one of the most evenly matched matches in the first round. And I'm going to take the Crusher in what you might consider a slight upset. I don't know. It depends who you are. But I think she's come a long, long way. I think everyone can agree on that since she's entered the Schmodown Arena. And I think it's finally all going to pay off with a uh, with a first-round win over Andrako. This match is one that we've all been looking forward to since it's a bona fide slugfest in round one. Both of these players have proven their versatility and potency in singles and teams, regardless of their win-loss record. They've also shown to have deep pockets of knowledge in some of the more difficult categories. Rachel certainly has the advantage in geek categories, but we can't overlook Andrako's comic knowledge either. However, Rachel Cushing, who is one of the biggest stories of the first half of the season, if not the story, will remind us that she's the unanimous rookie of the year as her second half of the season will finally take flight in this tournament, especially since she won't have to carry the baggage of Fredo Knapsack onto this particular flight. So I expect the Android to be crushed. I wonder if that's going to be a factor for her. This whole drama with Ken not being a partner, being a partner. I, I just wonder if that's going to hang over her. And In my opinion, I think this match is the most even on paper, at least. I look at both of these players and I say, wow, they have a lot of similar strengths and I could really see it going either way, but I think Mark Andreco is going to win. I have, I think it's his time to do something big. And I think a big win over the crusher is a statement win. As much as I like Rachel, I just think this is going to be a big one for Mark Andreco. Let's move to the other side of the bracket. Let's start in the top right corner. It'll be Clark Wolf, the classy one versus Miss Movies, Brie Ann Chandler, Brian, I'll start with you here. Who you got? As far as Wolf and Chandler, I actually made this pick a month ago. I told you guys off the air, as well as Chandler, that she'd win because of the, to be quite honest, I don't give an F moment. What I mean by this is the Schmodown works in strange ways sometimes. And every time I allude to this, people mistakenly think I'm saying the game is rigged. And that's absurd as I wouldn't devote 13 months of my life to covering a rigged game. However, I do believe in this greater power or force of energy, something that fantasy players and gamblers know a lot about, whether it's karmic shifts or chance or law of averages or probability or luck or happenstance, whatever you want to call it. I've talked a lot about Handsome Harloff's Nothing to Lose to her and how the best stretch of his career came at a time where he was ready and willing to retire upon his next loss. Furthermore, the Schmodown ebbs and flows kind of like blackjack. If you you play long enough, you're going to win. However, you're also going to lose, especially if you're trying to win. There are also times where you'll get the right cards and still lose. So when Team Action got Action Adventure for the third time, I never viewed that as an advantage like most people did. And sure enough, they had tougher cards that round. The same thing happened to Above the Line second 70 spin or Riley's Horror Thriller spin at Collision. So I'm always looking for when the game ebbs and flows for each team or player. There are peaks and valleys for everyone. And that's why I picked against Wolves of Steel in the semis because they weren't going to sustain their LTTP level of play against above the line. The same mindset applied to T10. They played too well in rounds one and two of the tourney to where they were bound to regress in round three, especially when they've never won three matches in a row. So 
In this case, Chandler is the one with nothing to lose, and that's why she'll win, especially since Clark is going to be pressing now that she's fresh off that heartbreaking loss against above the line. I'm going to pick Clark Wolf in this one. She's been a 70% player uh, throughout her career. Brian Chandler, she hasn't really touched that percentile in her career. She did get a, uh, a good streak going there in the team division. Hasn't really panned out for her in the singles. Um, I still believe that Clark Wolf is the overall more rounded player. And that's why I'm going to take Clark Wolf in a first round win. I'm also going to take Clark. I just, I like Brianne, but I just don't see any way that she wins this match. I just think Clark is one of these players that can make a real run here. Her and Riley made quite the run in the team tournament. And I just think, I feel like luck is on her side. So I'm just going to take Clark. All right, we're moving down to the next match. It is Mike the Killer Kalinowski versus Josh the Wild Man Makuga. Brian, who you got here? Makuga simply doesn't have what it takes to win a belt in this league. He's an entertaining squash match. Nothing more, nothing less. Kalinowski has shown that he has a crusher-like versatility across the board, whether it's singles, teams, or IGD. I'm not saying he's as dominant as Rachel in particular categories, but he should have won the Puddin' Fatal Five-Way, which was followed by a close loss to Cushing in IGD singles. Regardless, Mike is one of the few bona fide faces in a league that desperately needs a new and true face. And much like my MVP prediction in our Team Bracketology episode, I think Kalinowski's star becomes cemented during this tournament, whether he wins it or not. Again, with Merle and Riley gone, the Schmodown needs a new face of the league. Kalinowski has the marketability and the ability to be both the literal and figurative face of the league. Kalinowski advances. Franklin, you got Kalinowski, you got Makuga. What do you like it here? <laughs> I cannot, I actually, for like a second, I entertained the thought of Makuga winning because he does have crazy luck. And I was like, could it actually happen? And then I was like, nah, I'm going to pick Kalinowski to win the first round here. Fair enough. I'm also going with Mike the Killer Kalinowski. As much as I, I think most people would like to see a Josh McCuga run here, I don't think it's going to happen. The guy's got way too much going on. I just don't think his head is at movie trivia right now. Let's jump down to the next match. It is one half of Team Patriots, the team champions. Jeff Snyder versus one half of the former team champions, Matt Nost. Brian, who you got here? Nost has lost to Dewberry and McQueenie while he barely beat Dagnino and really shouldn't have beat RB3. So don't let the 2-2 two and two record fool you. He's never scored more than 14 points across a three-round singles match. So Snyder is going to make quick work of the pizza guy, reminding everyone why the Patriots have T10's number. I expect Snyder to go far in this tourney. However, the fact that he's playing at spectacular in teams is something that works against him in terms of that greater force that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to go with Snyder, but I actually think Nose is going to give Snyder a run for his money, make him feel quite uncomfortable. Yeah, Nose has had really just horrible luck in singles, and he's been very adequate uh, in teams, especially as of late. And uh, I just think, you know, Snyder, he's, he's really good, and he had some rough losses, uh, but he's been damn near unstoppable in teams, and I think it finally carries over into uh, the singles tournament. I keep seeing a lot of brackets as well, just like the Inman situation. I see a lot of brackets that have Matt Nose going far. I've, I've seen quite a few, at least 10 I can think of, which is admirable, but I think we're forgetting who he's going up against. This isn't just some guy. This is Jeff Snyder, one half of the team champions, a guy that was on the cusp of a title shot himself, somebody who Matt Nose has never beaten in teams, singles, or anything. So, as much as I'm a fan of the upset and the underdog, I just think that Jeff Snyder is going to win here. I, I think Snyder is going to go far in this tournament. Let's get to the last one here. It is Drew McWeenie going up against one half of Team Patriots, the team champions, JTE. Brian, who you got? 
I love reminding everyone that I not only predicted above the line to win the team tourney, I also predicted that Drew McQueenie would be the MVP of the tourney, something he currently is. However, because I rode him to glory so far in the team tournament, I cannot expect him to carry me again in this tournament. On my very first show 13 months ago, I stated how much I believed in JTE and how he had belts in his future. So I shouldn't have to convince anyone as to why I'd pick JTE in this spot. The guy is part of the greatest championship entity the Schmodown has ever seen. Plus, since this bracket was designed for rivalries and civil wars, I think the one civil war we're destined to see is Patriot v. Patriot. It's fitting since some believe that the only thing that can beat the Patriots is the Patriots themselves. So I'm taking JTE over MVP, setting up the civil war between Jeff and JTE. But make no mistake, people, Tom Dagnino is too wise to let a singles match between Jeff and JTE undermine the greatest championship force we've ever seen. I'm actually a little surprised Brian picked uh, JTE because uh, I know you're a big fan of your rhythm theory for McQueenie, but I guess rhythm only lasts so long. So, But like Brian, I did pick JTE. He did it to Bibiani. Why not to McQueenie? Uh, and, uh, yeah, I definitely want to see a jte Snyder match in that second round. Call it a three-peat because I also have JTE beating McQueenie, which is right now there's people listening to this that are just like, these guys are insane because McQueenie is the winner of a lot of brackets, a, a ton of them, quite the majority, I would say. But JT is this guy that just comes from out of nowhere and and does these things that you don't expect. Cody Miller match aside and Mark Riley match aside, JTE plays big in big games. So why not now? What a better time than now. So I would see, I'm also picking JTE to beat Drew McQueen. Singles and teams are two very different things. So I cannot realistically expect to ride drew all the way to single success so i've already gotten enough out of the guy in teams it would be greedy of me to think i'm going to get even more in singles so i'm going to take my business elsewhere this time around i certainly appreciate what he's done for me in the team tournament seems to be the hot ticket man a lot of, a lot of brackets will be busted i, I don't blame you for big and mcweeny i mean he's he is on a roll like we we rarely I, ever I see him. in the showdown so um, I don't know. I'm just saying other people out there who pick McQueenie, I, I don't blame them for picking McQueenie to get past the first round or even win the whole damn thing. I wouldn't be surprised either. I just, I hope I don't look like a fool uh, once again in the first round. Well, let's move on to our second round picks. How this will go is we'll say who we have in the second round and our matchups, and then we'll pick a winner from there. So Frank, tell me who you have in the second round in the upper left-hand side and who you have winning that match. All right. Well, before I give you my, Results. I just want you guys to pay attention to my final four and see if you can figure out the theme. But so I got Roca Levine and I have Levine winning. Okay. Brian, what about you? I've also got Levine versus JSR. As Levine has indicated on numerous occasions, he wants to destroy JSR. So I think it's going to take it to JSR, busting many people's brackets in the process. Sam's luck has turned in the Schmodown as Free For All rewarded him with some key karma that he's been riding ever since. I have Roca and Bibbs, the match that I think people have wanted to see for a long time. And I hate to say it to Bibbs, but I betray you. I, I got I'm John Roca beating Bibbs and moving on to the Final Four. I hate to even say it because I'm such a big fan of Bibbs, but I'm sorry, man. I just feel like the, the outlaw is uh, on a mission this time. Insert the I betray you, Jeff, right here. <laughs> there you go. Let's move down to the next one, Frank. Who you got there? So my matchup is Ellis versus Rachel Cushing, and I got Rachel Cushing winning. Okay, fair enough. Brian, who you got? I've got Howard versus Cushing. I'm intrigued by the idea of seeing Stacy and Rachel play each other, especially in a tourney match. However, Cushing is on another level, especially in the sweaty categories. Rachel advances. I have Ellis versus Mark and Draco. And as much as I, you know, touted Ellis is possibly winning this tournament once again, I think this is where his road ends. I like the Android here. I think the Android is going to go far as well. 
I have him moving on to face John Roca. Let's go to the other side, the Clark Wolf side of the bracket. Frank, who you got there and who you got winning? Oh, yeah, I got Clark Wolf versus Mike Kalinowski, and I am picking Clark Wolf. I believe she is on a mission. Fair enough. Brian, who you got here, man? I've got Brianne Chandler versus Mike Kalinowski. Sounds familiar. While Chandler has a chance, Kalinowski knows that he's got her number. Still, if she beats Wolf as I expect, she's got nothing to be upset about as that's her biggest win to date. But Mike will still advance. I have Mike the Killer Kalinowski versus Clark Wolf, and I am going to take Mike Kalinowski also. I think he's got a good chance to do some real damage in this tournament, so I have him moving on. Let's move down to the last one, the last lower right-hand part of the bracket. Frank, who you got here and who you got winning? Yes, I got Snyder versus JTE, and I am going to pick JTE. Wow, okay. JTE going to the Final Four. Brian, who you got here? I, too, have Snyder versus JTE, the Civil War. This is going to be one for the ages. It's also going to be one of the most viewed non-title matches to date. It just seems, though, like Jeff has a bit more knowledge in the classics and decades categories, but don't get me wrong. JTE is capable of beating anyone. I just think Snyder has a slight edge given his recent singles play and that close match against Harloff. I also have Snyder versus JTE. I think we're overlooking something, and that's the Tom Dagnino factor. I don't think in any way, shape, or form, if this becomes a match, that Tom Dagnino is going to let it become a match. I hate to say it, but they kind of alluded to it on the bracket special. Somebody might take a dive here. And I, I hate to say it, but I think it might be JTE. I don't want to accuse the lion's den of, of such cheating and things of that nature, but something's going to happen in that match if it does happen. But I'll take Jeff Snyder just to be on the safe side to beat JTE. Did you guys uh, figure out what my theme is here in my final four picks? I haven't yet. You want me to go, tell you? Go, going with the heels? No, no, no. Uh, so I have my final four is Levine versus Cushing and Wolf versus JTE. These were once upon a oh, time. Oh, my God, you're right. The, de- the decision the other way, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, well played. I didn't do that on purpose. I just realized it as we were going through the bracket. I'm like, holy shit. This is – Levine and Cushing was supposed to be a team once upon a time. The Wolf JTE deci- decision thing. So uh, I thought that was pretty funny and ironic. Well done. Well, tell me about your final four. Who do you have on the left-hand side? Yeah, so Levine Cushing, I'm going to take Sam Levine. I think he's got a big boost from being with McWeeny and riding, uh, riding high off of that team tournament run. So, yeah, I'm picking Levine over Rachel Cushing. After she's had an enormous run, uh, she will have nothing to be ashamed about losing to Sam Levine. Tremendous. Brian, who do you have here? I, too, have Sam Levine versus Rachel Cushing, and Frank just spoiled a key point that I was going to make. They were about to be team partners, but it fell through for a number of reasons, so how fitting that they now square off. I think Rachel is going to level Sam Levine in this one as the crusher seems poised for the final. I have John Roca versus Mark Andreco, which is something that nobody else had. And as high as I was on the outlaw defeating Bibbs in the previous round, I'm not as high on him as beating Andreco in this one. I'm really just riding Mark Andreco to the finish line here, just as I did Cinema Blend. Hopefully he doesn't come back to kill me like it did in that last one. I have Mark Andreco beating Roca going to the final. Let's jump on the other side. Frank, who do you have in the other final four here? Yeah, JTE versus Clark Wolf. Out for revenge, JTE is... And he's going to get close, but not quite. I'm picking Clark Wolf to have a Sam Levine versus Clark Wolf final. Very nice. Brian, who do you have in your final four? I've got Snyder versus Kalinowski. This one really had me struggling, but when I consider the greater forces at work here, I just don't think Jeff will be able to challenge for the singles belt while holding the team belt. That's spectacular. It's it's not that he doesn't have the ability. I just don't think the universe will let it happen. So Mike is the face this league needs right now with Merle and Riley frozen in Carbonite. All right, so that brings us to our final matchups. Frank, tell me who you got and who's going to win it all. And if you want to do your special Christian Harlot voice, feel free. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the Christian Harlow voice alone. That's for him. He's the Fair champ. Enough. He's the commission. <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't feel like I'm gonna. I want to embarrass myself. I've already done this with my bracket, probably. So with that said, I have Levine Wolf. Yes, and I'm gonna take Sam Levine as your tournament champion. Wow. Okay, Brian. Who you got as your champion in the finals, and who you have as your champion? My final match is Rachel Cushing versus Mike Kalinowski. New blood meets again, this time in standard singles. However, I expect the outcome to be the same as the former Bachelor and Bachelorette producers, Christian Harloff and Rachel Cushing, will battle for the belt come December at Spectacular. It's Rachel Cushing as the champion. I like it. In my final, I have the Android, Mark Andreco and Mike Kalinowski. The Android has been riding high here, destroying everybody in his path. But it is time for the Android to be killed off by Mike Kalinowski. And a Florida State graduate in Mike Kalinowski will win the singles movie trivia showdown tournament. Of course, that is in my opinion. But what did you guys think? Who do you have? Who's your champion? What is some big upsets you're looking forward to? What match in the first round are you looking forward to the most? Let us know in the comment section below and let us know which bracket you think is going to win. Will Frank continue his downturn? Will Brian continue his dominance? And will I just pick a random person to go far and they won't and I'll just screw my entire bracket? I guess we'll find out next week when the tournament starts. And of course, if you would like to fill out a bracket and enter the challenge, you could do that and submit it to schmodown2017 at gmail.com. Once again, schmodown2017 at gmail.com for your chance to win those big prizes. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Schmodown Rundown. We've enjoyed bringing you Bracketology. We appreciate it. My name is Aaron. You can find me on Twitter at AT Titanium. Frank Janish, where can you be found at? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankieJ29. And also be sure to follow the stats Twitter handle at SD Rundown Stats. Plenty of tournament stats will be popping up on that Twitter handle. So check it out. Right, Dave, where can you be found? Make sure to follow SD Rundown for all the latest episode links, guest announcements, uh, you name it, reactions to news. It's all there at SD Rundown. Like Frank said, at SD Rundown Stats. That's for all the latest and greatest stats. You guys can follow me, Brian Davids, on Twitter at BDF331, as well as film, schlubspodcast.com. And before we go, I want to make a quick mention of uh, Bobby the Brain Heaton. He is the greatest manager in the history of professional wrestling, and we lost him this week after a long sickness battle for him. So as, as I like to say that, you know, certain wrestlers and certain people influence the Schmodown, and there would be no Schmodown without this person, there would be no Schmodown without Bobby the Brain Heenan. So keep that in mind. And if you have a chance, go back and look at some of his old stuff. It's fantastic. But uh, Bobby, rest in peace. You made a lot of us very happy. And thank you for everything. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.